Okay, so I say it's about time that we got started. Hello everyone, happy Friday. I wanted to do something a little bit different with you all today. We've covered in the past weeks what point and figure charts are, how you read them, what ETFs are, how you use them, and I wanted to start off with a little bit of review today and going through a little bit more, not so much PowerPoints, I wanna actually use some tools. I wanna to go to some websites, mess around with some things, and explore how we can use other tools with the matrix and how it all works together. And also, how you can make your investment decisions a little bit smarter and a little bit easier. So without any further ado, let's get started with this. I want to first review a topic that we covered about two weeks ago, I believe. We talked a little bit about ETFs, but not just ETFs. We talked about the other options that we have for ETFs, such as inverse ETFs and leveraged ETFs. So let's start there. Let's talk about those two topics, shall we? I am going to go ahead and share my lovely screen over here. And I want to start off by looking at ETF.com. I, in that lesson on ETFs, I showed a bunch of different websites that you can go to to research ETFs. ETFDB was one, ETF.com was another, Morningstar is another very good one, and Finance Yahoo, if that's something you already use, they offer a little bit of information as well. But I wanna start here with ETF.com today. And I wanna look at something together. Let's, let's look at SPY. So remember that when we look at the market, and by look at the market, I mean the matrix, what we're doing is we're looking at the S&P 500. We're not looking at the entire market, that's crazy. All we're doing is we're looking at the 500 largest companies in the United States and how those companies are performing. And then we take those 500 companies and slice them up into a bunch of different ways. Just you can see my crazy arms doing whatever. But the whole goal is to be able to make smaller groups so that we can look at those groups and then buy and sell those groups. But everything we're looking at all belongs to one company or not so much a company, but a group. And that group is called State Street Spider, or SPDR. So today, I want to expand your spider web a little bit. I want to show you what else exists, how you can find other ETFs that Spider manages, but also how you can find other things that aren't Spider, but maybe cover the same thing. Jonathan, that is a great question, and let me answer that right now. So let's start off by looking at our benchmark or our way of saying, how is the S&P 500 doing? We don't just look at some index like dollar sign SPX or SPX. We look at the Spider ETF. So State Street, Spider, S&P 500 ETF. And remember, ETFs, their goal isn't to make as much money as possible. That's what mutual funds are for. Mutual funds are out there because they wanna make some profit because they get a little cut of the winnings. The goal of an ETF is not to make the most money, but to be the closest to how that index or whatever they're tracking is doing. So for example, if I looked at SPY, if SPY was a perfect ETF, it would be exactly the same performance that we would see for the S&P 500. Now, that's not always the case. And to show this, I wanna just quickly do this. So if we go to stock charts, we can look up dollar sign SPX, which is our index for the S&P 500. And then let's compare that to our ETF for SPY. Now, if we were in a perfect world, we wouldn't have a chart. The entire chart would just be one column, but that's not the case. We aren't in a perfect world, and a benchmark for the market isn't going to be perfect. So here we can actually see that SPY was bouncing up and down around how the S&P 500 is doing. But remember that if it's perfect, it will be always right at this point right here. But the one thing I can say is that it's pretty close. 
it bounces up and down. It has some periods that it, it stays closer than others. But the goal of it, and it does its job pretty well, is to follow how its index is doing. And that's the goal of all ETFs, is to follow their index. So now, what's the differences? What is the difference between SPY, Spider, and QQQ, which is another one of our ETFs? Well, let's look, shall we? So now, let's go back to ETF.com, and we'll start by looking at SPY. So if we do a search here, and we look up SPY, we see here that what is it tracking? It is tracking the US large cap index. So that is our 500 companies, well, 505, but 500 between friends. Of the 500 largest companies in the New York Stock Exchange, or as we'd like to call it, the S&P 500. So now, what are our other options though? Because remember that this is one company that tries to follow how its index is doing, but it's not the only company. And to find that, let's click here where we see equity US large cap. And now what we'll get is we will get, oh, it doesn't like to show me here. I'm going to use ETFDB. I like how ETFDB shows this better. So we'll, we'll go to ETFDB.com and we'll do our search for SPY. And here we're going to see the same kind of information where right down here we see the index it tracks and it's the S&P 500 index. So when we click into here, we get to see other ETFs that track the exact same thing. And remember how the goal is that we want to follow the market. We want our ETFs to follow the market very closely. Let's look here at our percent changes that we have. Here we have SPY. It went up 0.31% today. IVV is iShares S&P 500 ETF, up 0.31%. Vanguard's is VOO, 0.32%. Then we have another spider portfolio that is actively managed. This one is 0.30%. And then we have SPDN, which is Direction's bear ETF. What does that mean? It doesn't mean it's naked. That means that it is a, it's a bear market ETF which means it makes money when the market doesn't. Or let's look at how it did today, shall we? The, the SPY and many of our other ETFs have gone up today about 0.31%. The BEAR ETF went down by 0.24%. Remember, the goal of an ETF is to get close to its benchmark, but it may not always be perfect. We see this exactly right here, where if this was a perfect ETF, it would be negative 0.3%. Why? This is what's called a inverse ETF, which means that the ETF does well when the market doesn't, or when whatever it tracks is not doing well. So let's look at this a little bit more, shall we? Let's look at, let's go back to ETF.com. And I want to go back to the home page. And, no, where did it go? We go back here. It should offer us the inverse ETF listing. Darn. I'll have to find that and I'll have to show you guys on Tuesday. But for now, let's continue. So what is a inverse ETF? The inverse ETF tries to track the market exactly where it does better when the market doesn't though. 
because that is the point of an inverse. The inverse is when the market goes down, the ETF goes up. Why would you ever want to do that? Why is that a good idea? Well, because the market doesn't always do well. Right now, we are very, very lucky because the market is going up. And over time, it's been going up pretty consistently. So that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes the market is going to go down. And sometimes the market is going to go really down, such as back in March, there was one day in particular that SPY, which is one of the largest ETFs available, there was more people buying SPDN than there was SPY, which means there was more investors thinking the market was going to go down than was going to go up, which is very rare to see. But it gives us more options where you don't need to do what's called shorting. Typically, when you want to bet the market is going to go down, you need to do what's called a short, which involves a lot of extra steps that is not as easy as just saying, all right, I want to bet that that goes down. Because you need to purchase in ahead or in advance. You need to say, I will buy this many shares two months from now at this price. Inverse ETFs make that a little bit easier, where you just buy in like it was another ETF, and you make money when the market doesn't. Uh, Jonathan is asking a really good question. First off, love the name. When do we know the market is going to be down before it does to buy an inverse ETF? Unfortunately, that is something very hard to know because if we could predict when the market is going to go up or down, investing wouldn't be, wouldn't be investing. It would be just printing money. Sadly, we don't know when the market is going to go up or down, which is why we need to which is why we need to be very on top of what's going on because there are market indicators or there are things in the market that we will see that will tell us what's happening. One good gauge of this is going to be the BPI because the BPI tells us what percentage of companies in that market are on a buy signal. We can then say, well, if things are going, if the BPI is going up, and more things are going on buy signals, that's a good thing. That means that companies on the whole are rising. But as companies go on buy signals, there becomes more risk because there's not as much room to grow. And very often in the market, corrections happen. Investors got a little bit too greedy and then they're gonna go backwards a little bit. And that's where you need to be careful is watching the BPI is not just the higher it is, the better, the higher it is, or to use another analogy, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That can happen with ETFs or with the BPI as well. And keep in mind, BPI is something you can find for any market, but stock charts mainly has them for our sector ETFs and for the major indices. Uh, MM is asking, can I briefly explain shorting again or give an example? Sure. So. What's going to happen is you buy according to, you don't buy something right now. You say, I promise that I will buy this in two weeks. So what happens two weeks from now? You locked in that price. So you are obligated to buy that amount of shares at that price later on. So what happens if the stock goes up? What happens then is two weeks from now, you get your shares and you bought them. Let's say you bought Tesla. You put in an order for Tesla for 100 shares at $1,000 per share that is filled in two weeks. What that means is right now you own nothing, but your money is put aside in what's called a margin account. And that is where the money has to stay because two weeks from now, you have to buy. You have to buy that 100 shares at $1,000 per share. What happens if those shares now are worth $1,600? Well, that's where things like this will start to happen is you are going to start, if the company goes up, you're going to get a worse deal. If the company goes down, that's where the profit margins occur. But again, those are not things that you can do in a normal investment account. You need to have a separate investment account or a margin account in order to be able to do this. 
and correct. It's exactly what margin trading is. It's it's tricky, and it's something that is it's tough. It's really really tough. But what I want to show is that you can achieve the same goal of betting the market is going to go down and making money when it does by using inverse ETFs. Because in this example right here, let's look what let's look what this ETF did, shall we? SPDN is the ticker symbol. Let's look at what this company did or this ETF did back in March. Well, right here was March, and it went up to here. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot until you realize that that's a pretty big percent change. That is a very, very large percent change to happen just over the course of one month. But what happened when the market started to do better? Well, as the market does better, Inverse ETFs will do worse. Now, this is one alternative to our normal ETFs. Let's look at another. Because I've shown you how you can invest in saying the market's going to go down and make money when it does. Let's look, at, let's look at what's called a leveraged ETF. A leveraged ETF will say for every dollar this index goes up, my ETF is going to go up 3x. So I'm going to type in here 3x so we can get an idea of what exists. And I'll choose Directions Daily Technology Bull Shares. Or what this is, is this is our XLK, same index as the XLK, but for every dollar the technology sector goes up, we would expect this ETF to go up three times more, or $3. Hello? <laughs> hmm. Let's try ETFDB if this one's going to be mean. So what was that? We had direction 3x technology. T-E-L-C-L. T-E-C-L. So this is this is tracking the technology sector, and it is leveraged. Leverage is how we know what multiplier we have, or how much more the change will happen. So normal ETFs, such as XLK, XLB, everything we look at on the matrix, is all 1x leverage, so unleveraged. Three times leveraged means for every dollar the index goes up, we would make $3 here, which can create a lot of room for growth, but with more risk, or sorry, with more reward, there's usually more risk because if the market goes down with that index, you're going down too, and you're going down three times more. So it gives you a lot more options where, for example, if you look at the matrix and you want to say, oh, look, discretionary is performing pretty well. You can go here and you can look up XLY. Scroll down to see what index it tracks. So it, it tracks consumer discretionary. There's a surprise. Now we can go here and we can track or we can find other ETFs that track the same thing which would be, well, why are they getting rid of all my tools? Bummer. Let's try another way. I'm going to look up consumer, consumer discretionary over here. We'll do a search. Hmm, I don't know why technology and my websites are just being mean today. What if I typed leverage? I don't know if that would work. Let's try this. Consumer discretionary 3x. I believe, give me something. 
nothing, cool. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Um, let's, let's try and get this another way. Let's go look at the returns for TECL. We see a lot more activity. We see a lot more price change. And keep in mind something, that when you want to invest in an ETF, you can invest 100% of your money in one ETF, or if you wanted, you can be looking at spending one third that amount of money in a 3x leveraged ETF. So it gives you more options. Okay, let's, let's try a different sector. Let me see if I have a little bit better of a chance with another sector. Let's try FAS. So this is going to be the financial sector. Man, why, why is my website just not loading right now? I apologize for the technical difficulties. I have zero idea what is going on here. Okay. I'm going to have to improvise. Let's do this. I want to show something different because really inverse ETFs and leveraged ETFs are different options, but I want to show how you can take what you already know and expand the search from there to give yourself more options from where you currently are. One of the easiest ways to do this is to go to the company's website. So we're gonna do that together. We're gonna look up Spider, and we go to their website. I am sure, close enough. So here we can go to ETF Finder, and we can see that even though Remember, all of the sectors that we look at for the matrix are all from the spider group. So all of these are SPDR sectors, ETFs. Here, we see all of the ETFs that they offer. It's a little bit more than, you know, the uh, 12 sectors that we look at. And what are all of these? They are all tracking different things. Some of these are tracking the S&P 500. Some of these are tracking the S&P 600, which is gonna be your smaller companies. Some of them are going after sectors, such as all of our XLK, XLB. Others are going after industries. That is what I really want to share with you all today, is sectors is the starting point, but where do you go from there? In previous sessions, we've talked about how you take, once you find a sector, you can go and find companies within that sector. But there's another way to kind of slice the pie even smaller, where once we find a sector, you can then go in and find industries. So that's what, the, what I want to look at first together. One of the ways that you can do that is using ETF.com, but they're not going to cooperate. So I'm going to have to improvise here and I'm going to go to Finviz. Finviz offers a very easy way to see other sectors or to see other industries within a sector. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to see all of the sectors within or all the industries within one sector, but we do have something else that is, I would say, close to if not as good. The first thing I'm going to do is, well, I lost my be a profit, so I'm not going to do that. What I'll do here is I will highlight the ETF for technology. So now everything we're looking at is companies within the technology sector. And here we see listed a bunch of different sector or a bunch of different industries within that sector. So what you can do is remember, I showed how to set be a profit as different, different configurations or different labels here. So I'm gonna quickly do that so that we can get the same kind of information and see what we can do with it. Institutional ownership, we're gonna say over 50%. We have price to earnings, nothing. We have... Hmm. 
return on equity over 15%. Mm -hmm. Then we have 52 week high low. And then we have beta of less than two. Mm -hmm. So now we can see what sector companies are in, as well as we can see what industry they are a part of. Now, this is a really good way to be able to find a group that you want to look at. Once you've found a group, then what you can do is you can go up here and you can say, all right, I'm gonna reset everything. And I'm going to look at, by the way, someone was asking, how do you figure out what is what here? Consumer cyclical is discretionary. Consumer defensive is staples. So that is how they choose to label those. But what we can do is we can start with technology and then choose an, a specific industry. Let's choose information technology. And now we get our listing of companies within the information technology services. This is a good place to start, but how do you know that information technology is what you want? How do you know that this is even the right sector? Unfortunately, there is no way to be able to see this clearly on FinViz. The best that we have is we can go to groups, and instead of searching here, we can go to industry technology, and then we can go to custom. And this will let us see how all of the different sectors, or sorry, all the different industries within a sector are doing and how they are changing. So what I could say here is, say I wanted to find the hottest current sector or the hottest current industry. Well, consumer electronics seems to fit the bill. So what I could do then is I could go here and I could go and I could do consumer electronics and see if any ETFs pop up. I don't know why these search results are completely different. Uh, let's try this another way. Let's go to stock charts and let's go down to sector summary. And here, what we can do is we can go down to where it says complete industry summary. If, and then this will give you the different sectors within the same market or within their different markets where this is consumer staples, this is energy, and it's broken out by all the different indexes. Now these sadly are not ETFs, these are only industries. But this will give us an idea of where we can start searching. So I want to go back really quickly to, I want to go back to this because here is the way that we can find our leading sectors and our leading industries where you can start off by looking at sectors. Then you could just click on technology and get the companies or you can go here to industry technology and get your subsectors or your industries. And clicking into that will then give you the companies that are part of that industry in that sector. So this is how you could go from finding your broad, your broad sector to your industry to your company. What if we want to flip that? What if we want to start with the company and say, you know what, I like Tesla. Let's find ETFs that currently own Tesla. That we can do through Morningstar. I have no idea what's going on right now. The internet is rebelling against me and I don't like it. Okay, so on Morningstar, Let's look up Tesla. We can then go, this is very small. I'm going to make it bigger. We can then go here on the right hand side to where it says ownership. 
And clicking on ownership will then give us a list of all of the different sectors, or sorry, all of the different ETFs and mutual funds that currently are holding this, sec this company. So going to institutions will give us the actual groups, such as Vanguard, which has a lot of the VOO, VWO, and other ETFs like that. Funds will give us the individual funds. Some of these are going to be mutual funds. And this is the only challenge with uh, Morningstar, is that they will give you ETFs as well as mutual funds. And it's kind of difficult to know where some start and some end. So you might need to do a little bit of research. But what I can tell you is all of the funds listed here are funds that are all part of a index or part of a trading strategy that they own Tesla. How much of Tesla? Well, the total percent of shares held will tell you that. This will tell you what percent of Tesla they own. So they own 2.76% of Tesla. This company owns 2.76%, 2.26, so on. And then what percent of their whole portfolio or all of the money they're investing, how much of that money is in Tesla? That is what the percent total assets shows us. So that will show us where their money is. How much of their money is in Tesla? So this is how you would start with a company and then work up to a fund. Using something such as, I was going to say ETF.com, but they're being mean to me. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, uh, you can use stock charts in Finviz to go from a sector to an industry to a company. And you can use Morningstar to go from a company to an ETF. I've covered a lot of information and unfortunately some of the websites I was going to use aren't loading properly so I may have lost something in translation so I want to quickly take a second see if anyone has any questions and try and answer some questions or address any specific things that people want to talk about. No questions? Okay, then I shall continue talking. So I want to continue going down this path. I want to talk about how State Street has more companies, or sorry, more mutual funds, my goodness, more ETFs than meets the eye. It's not just our 12 ETFs that we look at. So how do you not get lost? How do you choose what you want to look at? Well, the first thing you need to decide is what do you want to invest in? Because ETFs are not just for stocks. ETFs can be part of any type of investment class. So that can be bonds. That can be currencies. That can be... Um, that can be commodities. It doesn't need to just be companies. So say you like Spider. Say, you, say for example, um, whatever trading platform or whatever broker you use has a deal where they give you the, they give you the, um, a discount. Or they'll, for example, pay off the expense ratio or not charge you a fee if you buy Spider ETFs. Well, going to the company's website is a great place to know what they offer and how you can use those that they have. Uh, Adelita is asking today, I learned that you can only buy mutual funds at the end of the day. Is that correct? Most mutual funds, yes. Some will allow you to buy them during the day, but that's very, very rare. And again, that's going to only be something that is offered because of your broker, not because of the mutual fund. But typically, yes, you can only buy a mutual fund after the trading day is closed and they open up to new investors. And that's for open mutual funds. Others, the only way to get in is if somebody gets out. 
and those are closed mutual funds. Those are a little bit trickier and tend to be a bit more of a hush-hush kind of market. Uh, Jonathan is asking, do you use point and figure to give the buy signal when it is an e inverse ETF? Yes. So the same rules apply to inverse ETFs as normal ETFs because the leverage is the most important thing that you will find because you will have a higher leverage, which means the price will be changing a lot more. Typically, the higher volatility, the more often you're going to have your buy and sell signals happening. So that's where things get a little bit crazy. But for single leveraged or for unleveraged ETFs, you're not gonna be looking so much for these crazy swings because you're just looking at it as another investment. So yes, I would be looking at point and figure to tell me when I would want to maybe consider buying. Remember, there are a lot of chart signals that point and figure gives, and just because something has a double top breakout or triple top breakout does not mean it's gonna go up. The market is crazy, we can't predict what will happen, all we can do is try and understand what's happening and use that information to figure out where we go from there. So where do we go from where we are right now? This is the crazy list that is offered by Spider alone, but they are only one organization. There are others out there, such as Vanguard, where you can go here and you can find all of their investments. You can go to iShares. By the way, there's something important about this, where some of these, I'm gonna use Direction as a perfect example, where Direction specializes in mutual funds and ETFs that are a little bit more out there. They like their leveraged and they like their bear or inverse ETFs. And here, we can get a full listing of them. So you can find three times leveraged ETFs, two times single, somewhere in the middle. And looking into any of these would give you all of the different three times leveraged ETFs that they offer. Some of these you see as, some of these you see as the consumer services, where there's two listings. One says bull, one says bear. Remember, bull's horns go up, which means that they're trying to think that the market's gonna go up. Bear swipes down, so bear would be saying that the market's gonna go down. So bear is a way to hear that it is a inverse ETF. And sometimes the 3X won't be said. It will sometimes say turbo or ultra or some other term like that. Sometimes they'll use fancy words for it. But what you really want to know is what leverage are we? So 3X, 2X, non-leveraged. And is it a bull? which is a standard ETF, or is it a bear, which is your inverse ETF? Jonathan is asking, how can we use the matrix to buy inverse ETFs? Do we see the sector that is losing strength? So it's a bit trickier because the same rules don't apply for, the same rules that we would look at for a sector going up doesn't so much, doesn't match what it would look like for tracking a sector going down. Typically, when you find a sector that is going down or losing a lot of strength, something that's going to start happening is investors are going to start jumping ship, but you don't know where the bottom is. And that's really the difficult part, is if you look and you find a sector like energy that seems like it's not doing too well relative strength-wise, it may not be that energy is doing bad, but it could just be everything else is doing better. So let's actually do that. Let's do this. Let's look at the chart for XLE. What I would be looking at here is if you were looking to buy inverse of XLE, you would want to see a double bottom breakdown. 
what I see is a bullish triangle, or sorry, a triangle forming. We don't know if it's bullish or bearish until it breaks out or breaks down. But it's not that it's doing bad. It's not that it's doing the worst. It's just not doing well. Let's compare this to one of our leading sectors right now. Let's compare this to the chart for discretionary, shall we? Straight up. Many of our leading sectors right now are in what's called a high pole, which means that we are on a very, very large column of X's that is more than three X's above the previous column. What that means to us is that we may have missed our buy opportunity and that we want to be watching for what's called a high pole reversal, which is if we switch into a column of O's, and our column of O's goes more than 50% down. That's usually an indication that the stock is starting to slip or it's losing its strength. And that's something we need to be very careful of because we see some sectors having very strong performance, but that doesn't mean that right now they're going up. It just means that they've been up. Let's look at another. Technology has been a long-standing high performer, but its chart looks about the same. Even though, if we go down here and compare it to one week ago, technology has gained six. But let's look at where the chart was one week ago. So right now we have a column of X's, four X's in August two X's in August. So it's only gone up two boxes, but that two boxes was enough for it to have plus six in its X count. So this shows that inverse ETFs and investing in inverses can be difficult. Just as right now, we are in much less of a volatile market than we saw in March or in April, where our ETFs are not changing crazy amounts every single day, we don't have new buy and sell signals every day, it's going to be a little bit slower. So with that, we need to look at the other options that we have available to us because our broad indexes are not moving as much, but that doesn't mean companies aren't. That doesn't mean that industries aren't. Uh, Adelita is asking, where do I see mutual fund and ETF performance to compare them? Should I see the relative strength? Yes, the relative strength is a great place to start. But another great option that I sadly probably can't show you because the website's not working is here they have an ETF comparison tool. Oh my goodness, it is working. So here I could go and I could compare SPY to, let's do QQQ. And we can compare how these two different sectors, or sorry, these two different ETFs are doing. So actually, I'm going to compare apples to apples here. I'm going to compare SPY to, let's do, let's do iShares. So what we have here is we have the exact same index. So now we're comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges or anything else. And let's look at the different things that we have, because not all, not all apples are made the same. The biggest thing that we want to be looking at is, what's it going to cost me? And that's what we call the expense ratio. That is what this, sadly, as much as I would love to say that getting a diverse portfolio is free, nothing in this world is free. They do charge a little bit of money, but what they charge is based on how much you invest. And they take a percentage of what's made, where that is called the expense ratio. So consider this to be your fee. The fee for SPY is 0.09%. And then the, the same fund, but from iShares, they only charge 0.03%. So, they, so Spider 
takes three times more money out than iShares does. Well, why is that? We've got to make sure that you know they're making enough money to make the difference. So let's look at how that happens. Let's look at how these two have performed over time. Well, one month, both are sitting at 4.3. Three months, okay, a little bit of a difference. Year to date, okay, a little bit of a difference. But over time, they look pretty similar. They have a lot of the same performance. Why is that? Because they track the same index. They are both two teams playing the exact same game. It's just a matter of who follows the rules better. And the answer for that is it depends. Because if you looked at only from January 1st of 2020 to now, SPY's doing better. But if you looked over the last three years, or five years even, iShares is doing better. When do they take that money out? That's a great question. So to go into that, there'd be a lot of math. I'm going to avoid all the math, and I'm just going to say a very simple answer. If you want a more detailed answer, let me know, and I can gladly give it to you. But the expense ratio is what they charge over a year. So if you were to invest with them in a year, they would charge you over that period of time 0.09%. However, they take out that amount every single day. So the calculation that they do is not just a day calculation, it's actually continuous. So it would be like saying every millisecond, if I added up how much money you owe me, that is the number you'd get. But if you looked at and compared from day one to day 365, it would be 0.09%. And that's where they get that expense ratio number, but it's something that they take out every single day. Again, there's a little bit more math that goes into it, some compound interest calculations, but I'll avoid that for the sake of my own brain not exploding. Anytime I get into continuous values, it gets a little. <laughs> so this is a great tool to be able to compare ETFs within the same market. But you can also compare it to its antithesis or to its opposite. So let's do that. Let's compare it to SPDN. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is um, we said this number was pretty big before because it was three times more. Well, if 0.09 is three times more, then this is five times more than that. So anytime you're going into an inverse ETF, sorry, not anytime, most of the time, because there's a little bit more effort involved, they're also going to take a little bit more profit. They're going to take their cut. So you're going to see usually a higher expense ratio. And let's look at how they're doing over time. Remember, in a perfect world, the only difference between these two sectors would be a negative symbol. So let's look at if that's the case. One month return, 4.3%, negative 4.23%. Three month, 14.43, three month, 13.44. And here is where things get crazy. Year to date, 6.22. Remember, we just compared SPY to another ETF that tracks the S&P 500, IVV, and both did exactly the same, or very close to it. So here's where things get a little crazy, is we would think that it would be somewhere close to negative 6.2%. It's far from that. So something happened, something in the beginning of the year happened that is a huge change. And sadly, it's very difficult to know exactly what it was. But remember that this is only one option. There are more choices out there for our inverse ETFs. And to be able to see that, please work. Please work. Nope. Don't even know why I tried. All right. Let's try ETFDB. Are you going to play nicely? SPDN. 
And let's go to S&P 500. Are you going to give me other inverses? No, you're not. Ah, oh, that's unfortunate. I apologize. I owe you guys a better explanation than I've given today in how you would compare ETFs. Unfortunately, ETF is not playing nicely. So that will make it a little bit tricky to show what I was about to show. But what I wanted to kind of get at is that you can find other inverse ETFs that will follow the exact same market. So you could say, let's try this actually, S&P 500 bear. Nope. Inverse. Cool. That's about what I thought. There are other options out there. ETF doesn't want to show them to us right now, but there are other options out there. But let's review because I've gone through a bunch of different things. And the reason that I've tried to share so much information today is I don't expect every person to go out and try everything. What I want to do is I want to show you how and why the matrix is just the starting point. It is step one, and it is a very, very good step one. But where can you go from there? Because I want to show you all of the possibilities that you can do with that information, where you can look at inverse ETFs, such as SPDN, which is just the complete opposite of uh, the S&P 500 performance. You can look at leveraged ETFs. Usually direction is one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest groups of inverse or leveraged ETFs. But then you can also look within that leading or the leading sector at a leading industry by going to Finviz, going to groups, and then setting your sector to whatever you want to look at, and then comparing the industries. And remember, this is all this is all free. All of the information that I've tried to share with you today is information that you can find for free because this information should be, and it should be something that you try, not as an active strategy. I'm not asking you to go out and start trading three times inverse leveraged ETFs, but it's something to be aware of so that you have some choices. You're not just looking at the matrix and saying, which of these 12 do I want to buy? because sometimes the best one to buy isn't any of them. Sometimes the best one to buy is looking into maybe discretionary and trying to find a leading discretionary industry. Because not all industries are made alike. Not all industries are gonna be doing as well as others. So why would you invest in the whole market or in the whole industry or the whole sector when you can go in and you can find an industry? And for many of these industries, there will be ETFs that match up. There will be an industry that does residential construction. Just like there will be an industry that would do auto manufacturers. And there are ETFs that will trade those portfolios. But you can also look at companies. You can find the leading sector, find the leading industry, and then from there, what if, you, what if you then applied be a profit? What if you went here and then you did be a profit? What would that look like? With my luck today, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna pop up with absolutely nothing. Watch. I try and be as real with you all as possible, which is why sometimes I'll try and just... Oh, beta over two? No, under two. I try and give you guys, I don't try and script things, I try and just show you guys and talk real time because I want to show you that I'm an investor as well. I try and learn this information as well. And hey look, we have two companies. I got very, very lucky. No, I'm kidding. I didn't get lucky. I kind of lucky. But what we have here now is we have discretionary, the residential construction industry, and there's two companies that meet our be a profit. 
let's go look into those really quickly and then we'll call it for the day. So LGIH, LGIH. Okay, so this is a company that has had a lot of movement in July. Let's try and figure out why. When was their earnings report? Earnings report was August 4th. That would not explain that jump in price, but very interesting nonetheless. So here it would not be really a buy decision yet because I'd be waiting to see a double top breakout right about there. But let's look at the other option, shall we? Let us see GRBK. <laughs> Gravy. That's a very interesting chart. But food for thought, not every, not every avenue you go down or not every street is going to get you home. They're not going to all lead you to the same place. But I've gone through and showed how you can do one industry within an entire sector. But that sector is only a small part of the entire market. And the market that we look at is still only the S&P 500. There's a lot of companies here and there in between. And Finviz Screener will give you exposure to that broader market. But it's not the only option. There are other ETFs out there that will do the same thing, but give you a, a diverse portfolio. So don't stop at the matrix. Don't stop at the 12 ETFs we look at. Take that as step one and then explore from there. Because there's a lot of exploration to be done, and all of it just comes together. Where some of, some of it will lead you to a great investment decision, others may just lead you on a wild goose chase, but you gain a lot of information and you learn a lot through the process. I hope everyone has gotten something out of today. Again, I don't expect that every single word I've said today clicks right now. But I hope that in everyone, there's been one thing that I shared that has made you want to go try it, made you want to go explore, and has helped make your investments that much simpler. Thank you guys all so much for joining today. I will hopefully have a little bit more information and I can go through some more examples with ETF.com on Tuesday. But I really appreciate everyone's patience and understanding and participation in today's class. Thank you all so much, and we will see you next Tuesday. Take care, everybody.